thank you, uh, Sheila Page. I, I really wanted to follow up and even put more strongly uh, one of the things Charlotte said, which is uh, I wanted to question Armin on the policy implications. It's one thing to say that national governments should take affirmative action within their own things. And all of your examples were that, whether they were the US or Malaysia, those weren't done because of external pressure. And Malaysia was very much against most external uh, views at the time, the sorts of things it did. Do you really want international agencies to, to take sides, as Charlotte put it? And do, you, uh, do you know of any successful example where it was done through international agency as opposed to national? And, and to Francis, um, again, I'm sort of following up what Chris said, uh, on the Latin America-Africa comparison, which I also jumped at, could, this, could you develop this? I mean, is it differences in income levels, differences in the age of the country, differences in the types of struggle, which are the types of inequality which you're seeing? I, mean, I, I do find the idea that Latin Americans are just different from Africans slightly odd. <laughs> I'm sure that's not what they were trying to say, but we'll see. Um, did you want to come in? If you could, can we have, um, if you could be brief and introduce um, yourself. If um, HIs have implications for DFIT, why not for FCO? Can um, you introduce yourself? Oh, um, from Women for Justice and Peace in Sri Lanka. Oh, why not? HIs are relevant or um, implications for as much for DFID as for FCO, and uh, that can be easily seen in what uh, Minister Alistair, uh, Alistair Burt uh, went and uh, said in Sri Lanka and came here and said um, his, um, his absence is very much relevant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any other questions at this point? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thanks. I'd be interested to hear the panel's... Can um, you introduce yourself? Sorry, yes, Annette Fisher from GRM International. Um, I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on what the role of civil society organisations is within the policies that are being recommended, and particularly some of the actions that you've analysed in these uh, works. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Joe. Joe Hanlon. Um, I just wanted to agree with Sheila and say that if you look at Southern Africa, which I work on, DFID policies, World Bank policies, have always gone against government attempts to reduce horizontal inequalities. <laughs> and I think that it's a little late in the day to say that we should be... <laughs> so maybe the answer is that we should try to at least get DFID to be ha a bit more hands-off <laughs> when governments want to try to do <laughs> progressive <Yeah>. things. <laughs> And that, that even that would be progress. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thanks very much. Any more questions at this point before we go back? Okay. Um, Francis, do you want to? Uh, yes. I think a lot of the questions were about, <coughs> you know, what can or should international agencies do? And I think because we were presenting the affirmative action book, you felt that the policies we recommended were all about affirmative action, which isn't at all true. We talk about indirect as well as direct ways of achieving this. And DFID can do huge amounts by investing in northern Nigeria, for example, northern Ghana, and it's hardly taking sides when one side is so much poorer than the other. And just to go back to one very successful case, Nepal. <coughs> True, the government wanted this, but the international agencies were totally on board, and in fact, DFID commissioned some research supporting the view that horizontal inequalities were a cause, and then followed it up. It was DFID-led. And it was not at all provocative. It was a question of putting more investment into the hill places, putting more investment into lower classes. It did not cause, if anything, it uh, prevented uh, recurrence of conflict. So I think there is a huge range that international agencies can do. And of course, they can also stop doing harm. Yes. And when you think about it, you know, all this sort of tentativeness, who are we to intervene with local policy? Well, we go trampling in with our macro policies, which cause mm. immense problems, but we say we're too sensitive to do something about gross inequalities. And so at the very least, what we're trying to do is to get this into the debate so that it's an issue which is considered before international agencies and national agencies take action, instead of being one that is just conveniently laid to one side. Thank you very much. Um, can I just... A couple of things to pick up there. One was um, Chris's point about um, is an elite bargain all you need? I'm 
I'd like to put that one to you. The other is just this general sense that there's an extraordinary moment right now through the goals process and the goals discussions of thinking about value in development, what is valued and in a analytically and what is valued in terms of outcomes. And of course, one of the big debates covers in a sense the intersection between violence and inequality around the extent to which goal frameworks, you know, the post-MDG successor, should take up either of those issues, should take up the measurement or targets and goals around violence and also targets and goals around inequality and horizontal inequality. So I'd be very interested to get your responses on both of those. Yes, first on the um, elite bargains. Sorry I didn't come back to that. I think elite bargains may work for a short period, but they're dangerous because you left, and I think when Rosemary comes to talk about Peru, you'll see this, that, uh, not that they did much bargaining with the elite, but still, you can have long periods in which one group is suppressed, but it's not going to, if you, you're only interested in, even if you're only interested in violence, that's not going to work forever. It's going to come back and bite you at some point. So the elite bargains can be a good temporary solution, but not a long term. And I think that's one of the sad things about modern post-conflict settlements, that they think about the elite, but they don't think about the underlying thing. Uh, but and I'm also actually interested in justice as well. And that's another side. I, it's not the work here, but I'm now working much more on justice. And I think that the injustice of this situation is such that whether elite bargains work or not, it's not satisfactory. Uh, and that brings me to the MDGs. Um, you know, I could talk for ages on the MDGs. My vision of the MDGs is very different from a set of goals, really. It's a set of principles, my vision, in which national discussions and eventually, uh, I suppose, national governments come to an agreement about what they want to do. And But the principles would be agreed internationally, globally. And those principles would incl indeed include security which goes well beyond v the violence of uh, conflict we're talking about, but to domestic violence, to all sorts of other violence. And so, yes, they would be there as part of the principles, and then it would be for the national governments to see how to deal with them. Thank you very much indeed, Francis. I mean, yeah. well, uh, maybe on the, on the policy point, I mean, I think Francis has sort of um, indeed pointed out that international community can start by do not harm. I mean, I think that's that's uh, the chapter on the macroeconomic policies in, in the post-conflict book, I think clearly has that message that uh, we need to start thinking about the impact of these policies. And I think that's where we, we can make major, <coughs> major uh, gains, or ha we still have to make major gains in, 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 in increasing awareness, um, even though the, the poll was very, very uh, positive, obviously. Um, on the durability, I mean, I think, the point Chris made that indeed uh, you're right that the socioeconomic horizontal inequalities are very durable. However, the political ones are not, and that sort of it, it is this sort of it sort of links up with the other finding that particularly when they overlap or when the inequalities run in the same direction, then it becomes tricky. So what you can have is indeed you can have a long-term socioeconomic situation s characterized by very sharp inequalities. But because the political system is rather inclusive, which you might refer to as your elite bargains, we could argue whether political inequality is broader than that, but still it could work on that level, that it could be stable. But once that flips over, then we see, indeed, if you, 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 you become, uh, the, the situation becomes very explosive, and, and we have seen that on, in, in several cases. The best example is, for instance, the Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast has had very sharp inequalities between its north and its south for a very long time, ever since colonial periods. Was politically inclusive under and, and had a, an elite bargain, so to speak, under under the first president Fouad uh, Bouni, who was in charge for 35 years. That worked perfectly. It was very stable. It was known as the 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 the, the, the miracle, the African miracle, the oasis of peace in Africa. However, once we see in the 1990s that political inequalities start to become very severe, actually, that the same groups, the northern people uh, who are economically disadvantaged, also become politically excluded, we see actually mobilization along those lines, and we see how quickly a country can disintegrate. So the durability, yes, is a, it, it, it makes a compre uh, it, it's not yet a paradox, but it was a paradox, and we start to understand why that can switch over and still come, uh, become a very dangerous situation. I'll leave there. If it's, um, do you want to? 
um, come back on something. I mean, I, th I think I, I just thought I might say a couple of mm. points. There's a couple of questions sure. that were sort of directed probably a bit more to, to us at Diffid. I mean, I think, um, you know, as, um, as Francis says, there's a, there's a whole range of initiatives, I think, that Diffid has been taking to really um, yeah, address and um, to really sort of upscale some of the support, particularly to geographic areas. I mean, as the book says, ge geography often overlaps with you know, caste and identity. And I think that's been a really significant change over the last, you know, the, over the last um, few years. But, you know, you mentioned our support in Nepal and northern Nigeria. I mean, that's also happening a, in a whole range of other places. And in my work on the Middle East, you really can't begin to understand what's happening you know, in the post-uprising environment without really understanding those, uh, those inequalities. And a number of our programs have are really looking at those kind of geographic areas that have been so marginalised as a result of that. Um, and we work very closely with the Foreign Office as, as well. And I think, you know, I think this, this is all quite, you know, significant, it signifies a much, a really big shift in the way that, that we're working. And certainly inequalities have been really highly prioritised um, throughout the work at the moment. But, you know, we're really open to people's ideas about what more we can do. So do come talk to me later. Thanks very much.